My name is Tom Diggins. I operate Monterey Walking Tours. Every year since 1931, with the exception of the years during World War II, the Monterey History and Art Association has celebrated Sloat's Landing. It was my pleasure, in working with the MHAA and MOM, the Museum of Monterey, to coordinate the 165th anniversary of that event, when the Stars and Stripes were raised over the Custom House in Monterey by forces under the control of Commodore John Drake Sloat and making California part of the United States in July of 1846. This is easily one of the most momentous events in American history, and it literally happened 100 yards from where I'm sitting now. This is what was going on. One year before, in 1845, President James Polk had sent a communication to Congress outlining his foreign policy. Essentially, it was an extension of the Monroe Doctrine. And what it said simply was, the United States had a God-given right to expand its borders from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. That came to be known as Manifest Destiny. Well, at that time, the United States only had 28 states. 25 of them were east of the Mississippi. West was the vast territory of the western United States, part of Mexico. So who was Polk talking about with Manifest Destiny? Well, first of all, he was speaking to the Russians. The Russians were in Alaska, and they had an outpost in California. He was speaking to the French. The French had armed forces in Mexico. Polk was definitely speaking to the British. We were in dispute with Great Britain over the borders of the Oregon Territory, Pacific Northwest, and Canada and we actually had some skirmishes out and around Puget Sound. And Polk was definitely talking to Mexico, because Mexico blocked the way to the Pacific Ocean. Mexico owned what is now California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, parts of Wyoming, Arizona, and New Mexico, as well as some disputed territory with the border of Texas. It was definitely in the way of our westward expansion. So now we go to 1846, where we find Commodore John Drake Sloat in the Bay of Mazatlan, Mexico. He has three U.S. warships, and there's a British warship in the bay with him as well. Sloat has very vague orders. He's told to protect United States citizens, to protect the interests of the citizens of the United States, and in the event we are at war with Mexico, to deploy his forces to his best advantage. These orders are a year old and Sloat is desperate for news. He hears about a battle on the Rio Grande, and he's waiting now to hear if this will lead to war with Mexico or not. He decides not to wait, and he sails to Monterey, where he arrives 27 days later. Now, on his journey, Sloat had several important things to think about. First of all, were we at war or not? Secondly, Sloat had no idea the size of the Mexican force that waited for him in Monterey. How many guns, how many men, he had no idea. But also, Sloat wanted to be sure he did not repeat a very embarrassing incident that had occurred just four years before in 1842, when under similar circumstances, Commodore Thomas Catsby Jones had sailed into Monterey, thinking that we were at war with Mexico, raised the American flag over the Custom House, and declared California part of the United States. American Counsel Thomas Larkin of Monterey comes down and tells Commodore Jones that hostilities with Mexico have not commenced, and that in fact he has declared war with Mexico. Jones is forced to lower the American flag, pay several hundred dollars in damages to the Mexican officials, and he sails away in embarrassment and disgrace out of Monterey Bay. Sloat is anxious not to repeat this either. And he arrives in Monterey Bay and he begins discussions with Thomas Larkin. He's seeking information and intelligence. He learns that General Castro has removed all of his troops from Monterey, so he has no opposition. He's learned that John C. Fremont has been working with the Bear Flag Revolt up in Sonoma 
and has 200 troops coming his way. He also learns that we are finally now at war with Mexico. So he and Larkin write a proclamation. And on July 7th, 1846, Sloat sends a force of 250 armed sailors and marines ashore in Monterey. The proclamation is read by a junior officer from the USS Cyan. And the proclamation states that although he comes with a powerful force, Sloat comes as a friend to the people of Monterey. He makes everyone in California an American citizen. And if you do not want to be an American citizen, you are allowed to leave. He maintains all of the existing laws and property rights, all the office holders, all the infrastructure. And so for the most part, the people of Monterey are happy with this, and they cheer and huzzah. Sloat takes over Monterey without a shot being fired. He goes to the hapless Mexican artillery captain who's left in charge, and he's asked for his surrender, and the captain says, I have no authority to surrender, nor do I have any guns or supplies to surrender to you. The troops go off and march about half a mile away to the El Cartel, which was the Mexican government headquarters and the army barracks, where they find no one, and they take over the government of Monterey. Now, this event was not without incident, because as they began to raise the flag, the halyard got stuck, and the flag was about halfway up the pole. The young ensign who was in charge of the color guard immediately leaps over, grabs the ropes, and begins to yank on them to no avail. Finally, a young midshipman takes off his shoes, and he shinnies up the flagpole, and he clears the halyard so that the flag of the United States can be raised on the pole. It's not for two more weeks that the British warship that had been in Mazatlan with Sloat sails into Monterey Bay. Sloat had outsailed him by two full weeks. And as the, the Collingswood came around Point Pinos, Admiral Seymour kept bugging his quartermaster. Quartermaster, do you see a flag? Quartermaster, do you see a flag? Quartermaster, do you see a flag? Until finally the answer was, yes, sir. What flag is it? It's the stars and stripes of the United States. And so much to the amusement of his officers and men, Admiral Seymour slaps his thigh and says, by God, I've come too late. Later, as he speaks to Sloat, he asked the Commodore, what would you have done if you had sailed into Monterey and found a different flag flying? And Sloat replies, I would have fired at least one volley and would have gone to the bottom. So just a matter of timing, in this case, just a couple of weeks, we may have become a British protectorate. Now, even though there was no shots fired in Monterey, there were a few battles in Southern California. General Castro kept withdrawing his troops until finally he met the forces of William Kearney near Los Angeles between San Diego. He, Kearney was not doing too well in these battles, so Commodore Stockton, who had replaced Sloat, and John C. Fremont combined their forces, sailed to Los Angeles, and basically bailed out General Kearney. So the fighting had stopped in California by 1847, but the Mexican War continued until 1848. And it turned out that the Mexican War was a training ground for all the young lieutenants and captains that had come out of West Point who learned their trade that they were able to use 15 or so years later when they faced each other across the battlefield at Antietam or Gettysburg. So the thing that amazes me the most is that, again, all of this happened just within yards of where I'm sitting today. And that's why the Monterey History and Art Association and the Museum of Monterey celebrate Sloat's Landing.